Father, one of the things that has always impressed me about the Cleburne Church is that their fearlessness in regard to preaching the word of God. And Father, I wanna pray that you would help me to continue that tradition. That you would help me to rightly divide your word, Lord, and rightly teach it and lift up Jesus. Lord, may I not, un, may I un, not offend somebody unnecessarily here today. If they do need to be offended, then so be it, Lord. But if they don't need to be, help me not to be the problem. But may my words be seasoned with salt. And may I give a reason for the faith that, that I have. Lord, we invite you here. We invoke your Holy Spirit to be present and with us. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, I'm going to grab a piece of some water down here. And I think our slides should be showing up here pretty soon, too. We all set up there, guys? All right. Oh, they were ready. I just did work the clicker. Thank you. You guys are on the ball. Title of our talk today is God's Not Dead. Everybody say, God's Not Dead. Not dead. He's alive. He's alive. I, believe it, I believe it. And I can prove it. Prove Let's it. say it again. God's Not Dead. He's alive. alive. I believe it. believe it. And I can prove it. All right, let's see if that's the case. Why are you a Christian? Have you ever stopped to ask yourself that question? Why are you a Christian? Now, there are 4,500 different religions in the world. Why did you settle on this one? Now, there's some of you here today saying, I'm not a Christian. Or maybe you're watching on YouTube or whatever else and saying, you know, I'm not a Christian. Well, here's why you should consider being a Christian. Amen? Because God's not dead. He's alive, I believe it, and I can prove it. In fact, one of the things that's amazing about Christianity is all the other founders of other religions, you can find their bones. But Christianity, the founder of Christianity, you can't even find his body, for goodness sakes. Because he's alive, amen? I love the text that was just read for us. So let's open up our Bibles really quickly because I want to make sure that we ground this in the Word of God. Uh, One of the most amazing things about Christianity is that the founder is not dead. And here's the passage that we're using today. It's in Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 1. Say amen if you have it. Now upon the first day of the week, what day is the first day of the week? Sunday. Sunday. Saturday is the seventh day, the Sabbath, amen? But the first day is Sunday. Very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. Very interesting, these ladies didn't know that Jesus was alive. They were living like he's dead. Many Christians are just like these ladies and these gentlemen. Even though Jesus is alive, we're living like he's dead. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass as they were much perplexed thereabout, Behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. It's interesting that if we really believe that Jesus was alive, we'd be perplexed a lot less. And they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, and they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? The angel spoke to them and said, Why seek ye the living among the dead? And here I want to say to you today, if you're an atheist, a skeptic from some other religion, why in the world would you look for all the, the God's church among the dead when you could look for him among the living? God didn't make it confusing. He didn't want us to roam around in Babylon all of our lives and wonder which is the true religion. He said, no, it's very simple. The true religion is the one where the founder rose from dead. He's alive. You know, I love this little story about a Buddhist monk that converted to Christianity. And they asked him, why did, why did you make this decision to convert to Christianity? He said, you know, it's really this, that simple. I'm walking down the road and I come to a fork in the road and on one side is a dead man pointing like this, that I should follow his direction. On the other side, other fork is a living man saying, come, follow me. And he said, you know what? I just went with the living guy. <laughs> simple. But God made it so simple for us to know. You know, a lot of people are bugged with the fact that can you really prove God? Can you really prove his existence? Now, I want to say something very carefully to you today, but it's very important Many times in churches, we're trying to prove that God loves people, right? We're trying to show that God loves. And that's very good, but sometimes we need to step back because a lot of people are wondering if God actually really exists at all. Amen. And so I want to talk about that today. But there are many proofs in the Bible that God is not dead. Amen. Say with me, God's not dead. God. He's, alive. He's alive. 
I believe it, and I can prove it. And you should not be ashamed about saying you can prove the existence of God, amen? I hear people all the time trying to be scientific and say, you can't prove God. Baloney, look what the Bible says. Let's read it together. Acts 1, verse 3. To who he showed himself, what? Alive after his passion by many, what? Infallible, what? Infallible proofs, amen? Turn to the person next to you and say, you can prove God. I like what Ellen White says. You all believe in the gift of spirit of prophecy, don't you? A lot of people say, why do you preach using Ellen White at all? Because I don't like to preach with one hand behind my back. I like to preach with both. I want to fight with both fists, amen? I want to use the word of God and spirit of prophecy, amen? Remember, the word of God is above spirit of prophecy, amen? But listen to what she says. I love this. This is powerful. Let's read it together. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient what? God's not into blind faith. God never asks us to believe without giving sufficient evidence. Let's read on together. Upon which to base our faith. His character, the truthfulness of his word, are all established by testimony that appeals to what? Reason. And this testimony is what? Abundant. Now this is very important to listen today to this next part here, okay? Yet, read it together. Yet God has not removed the possibility of doubt. Our faith must rest upon evidence, not demonstration. Those who wish to doubt will have opportunity, while those who really desire to know the truth will find plenty of evidence, amen, on which to rest their faith, amen? I think that's awesome. God is not into blind faith. He gives us all kinds of reason, all kinds of evidence that he exists. So don't fall into that default mechanism of saying, I'm agnostic. Really, when you say you're agnostic, you're saying, I'm lazy. Instead, we need to study the evidence and take a look at it and let science lead us to the true God. The evidence is there. You know, there's a lot of brilliant people that believed in God. (laughs) Don't let somebody tell you that uh, you have to get rid of reason in order to to be a theist or to believe in God, amen? Very, very intelligent people. By the way, many people have come to faith through science. Not opposed to science, but through science. Listen to these very intelligent people. I think most people would agree that these men on the screen here were pretty smart. And there are hundreds more, but I just chose the ones I knew we'd all recognize, or at least I could recognize. (laughs) Sir Isaac Newton, William Shakespeare, Louis Pasteur, and who's the last one? I don't know who Einstein is, but they say he was sort of smart. This is what Einstein himself said. Now, now I should make sure I let you know that Einstein was never a theist. We don't really know. I'm not really sure what his belief was regarding intelligence. But the fact of the matter, this scientist, this brilliant mind, knew there had to be a God. Amen? Listen to what he wrote. The scientist's religious feelings takes a form of rapturous amazement at the harmony of natural law, which reveals a what? Intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an absolute insignificant reflection. Listen to this. I defend the good God against the idea of a continuous game of dice. So don't let them tell you that to believe in God means you have to check your brains at the door. One of the things that's happening in many universities today is professors are trying to get young people in a false dichotomy between faith and reason. In other words, you have to choose one or the other. You can't have both. Baloney. I'm here to tell you today, you can have reason and faith and believe in God, Almighty God. They're not separate. By the way, the beautiful thing about the Bible is the Bible is jam-packed full of science. Amen? Amen. The circuit of the earth. The Bible talked about the earth being round. The Bible talks about air having weight. Amen? The Bible talks about sanitation. The Bible talks about the fountains of the deep. The Bible talks about the currents over the water. Don't tell me the Bible's against science. No, you can use reason and come to God just as well. In fact, the Bible says it's the knowledge, <laughs> the, all the evidence for God. The Bible actually argues that if, if you de- deny God, then you're actually the one that's irrational. And that's saying it nicely compared to David. Listen to what David said. The fool says in his heart, there is what? No God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. So I want to take a look at seven evidences for God. And obviously I'm going to have to go through them really quickly. But I believe we should be studying in depth every one of them. Amen? In fact, I've got to tell you right now, church, 
One of the reasons why we're losing between 70 and 90% of our young people in secular universities is because we have not trained them what I'm going to share with you today. We have not taught them to be able to stand and defend their faith in God. What we often do in our churches, which is a huge mistake, and I've seen this as youth director throughout Texas and around the world, is we've done this. We've allocated science to the schools instead of teaching it in our local churches. Young people need to understand what evolution teaches, and then our teachers need to deconstruct evolution using science and reason. Our young people need to be inoculated against what they're going to be facing in many universities today. That's my challenge for your New Year's resolution. Number one, design. Everybody say design. design. One great evidence for God. Oh, you guys are awesome. Isn't he a good man? <laughs> Brought me some water. He knew I was getting long-winded and dry up here. Design. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Are what seen? Are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are what? Without excuse. If you have a builder, if you have a building, you must have a what? Builder. If you have a painting, there must be what? Paint. If you have design, there must be a what? Even if you can't see him, it just makes sense. Amen? Look at this right here. Imagine you went into a gallery. I don't think anybody here would go into the gallery and think that nobody painted all those paintings simply because you can't see the painter. Science is evidence. Design itself proves the existence of God. In fact, the more we know of science, the faster we run to God, the less we know about science, the farther we run away. So in other words, get to know science, amen? Study and find the design. You know, one of my favorite stories is the story of Antony Flew. Antony Flew was the Richard Dawkins of his day. Richard Dawkins is a famous atheist. You see him all over today debating Christians. He was the Richard Dawkins or Bill Mayer of his day. Loved to mock God. In fact, this man right here attacked and debated C.S. Lewis himself. Some say he won. Unbelievable debater. But in 2004, guess what happened? He converted. He decided, you know what? I've looked at the evidence of design through science, especially with DNA. And I believe there's a holy, divine, intelligent code in DNA. And he converted as a result. 2004, he shocked the atheist community by saying he now believed in God. Design. The fine-tuning. Everybody say fine-tuning. Fine. Fine-tuning of the planet. So not only do we have design, but we have the intricacy of the planet that allows life to exist. Unbelievable fine-tuning. Imagine if you were going to a hotel today and you walked in the hotel, the first time you were ever in the hotel before, but you opened the door, walked inside, and you looked, and there were painted pictures all over the wall of your family. All your family photos are up there on the wall. You go over to the refrigerator and you open it up and your favorite food is inside there. Your macaroni and cheese is in the cupboards or whatever else. Your vegetarian meat is in the cupboards. Your diet Sprite or whatever else is in the refrigerator. Everything that you have always wanted is there. In fact, you go over to the drawers, you open them up, and there's your favorite clothes. I mean, I think a rational human being would say to themselves, you know what? Somebody must have known I was coming. This world was designed with you in mind in order for you and I to exist, amen? You know, it's interesting that if we didn't have Jupiter, we'd be dead. If we didn't have Jupiter and its gravitational pull, it pulls away the asteroids from hitting this, this world, we would be bombarded by thousands of times more asteroids that hit us just from time to time. It would be like raining asteroids if it wasn't for Jupiter, if it wasn't the right distance from our planet, amen? You know, back in the 1960s, I believe it was, famous astronomer named Carl Sagan began to say that all you need for life is you just need a planet and you need a proper distance between, uh, or I'm sorry, all you need is a star and the proper distance between a planet and then you can have life. And this is why back in the late 60s they started looking for extraterrestrial creatures out on the, in the worlds. They thought, wow, if that's all you need for life, then it should be easy. Guess what? They're still looking. And now they've upped the ante to 200 different factors have to be in place in order for the fine-tuning of, of life to be on a planet. Unbelievable. Our planet was designed with you in mind. I'm not a scientist, but the more we study science, the more we realize it's not by chance. Someone monkeyed with the bio, bio, biology, 
the chemistry and science of this planet. And that someone is no monkey. He's God Almighty, amen? amen. The great God of the universe, intelligent design. So number two is fine tuning. Number three is irreducible complexity. Say irreducible complexity. Irreducible. Interesting, very interesting. Um, that creation had to come about instantaneously like we're taught in Genesis. Because things could not exist if they evolved because they needed all their components together at the same time. Are you with me? One of my favorite examples is the little bombardier beetle. I love this little thing. Have you guys heard of the bombardier beetle? Outstanding little creature. This, this little bombardier be beetle is like the stone that takes down the Goliath of doubt and skepticism and atheism. This little tiny bug. I'll tell you why. This little bug has two very volatile chemicals inside of it. It should blow sky high with these two chemicals inside of its little abdomen. But you know what God did? God put an inhibitor, inhibitor inside that little bug. That inhibitor keeps those two things from blowing up. Evolution should have stopped a long time for that little bombardier beetle. He'd have blown himself sky high if those two chemicals came together. But God in his great wisdom put an inhibitor to keep that from happening. But you know what? How is that going to protect that little uh, bombardier beetle from predators? Here's the amazing thing about God. God gave that little bug an inhibitor for the inhibitor. The inhibitor keeps it from exploding. The inhibitor for the inhibitor allows the inhibitor to step back. So an explosion can ha happen outside of the bug's abdomen and shoot a spray and fry his enemies. <laughs> Talk about gas problems. This bombardier beetle has it. <laughs> Unbelievable. God knew that it would explode without an inhibitor, and God knew it would be eaten without the inhibitor to stop the inhibitor, and God created a weapon, a double barrel shotgun, out of the, barrel of the abdomen of this little creature that shows that God takes down the mighty with his incredible wisdom. That's just one example. Number four, morality. Amen? I love this right here. In Romans chapter 2, 14 through 15, you can read it with me. For the Gentiles show the work of the law written where? In their hearts. Their conscience also bearing witness. And between themselves their thoughts accusing or else what? Accusing them. Have you noticed that no matter what country you live in today, people all believe that certain things are wrong? We have a moral code within us. In fact, C.S. Lewis really struggled with the fact of suffering in the world and why evil things happen. And finally he's like, you know what, where did I get the idea that evil things happen? Where did I get the concept that some things are right and some things are wrong? And he suddenly realized there must be a great mind behind all the moral compass that we have placed inside of our hearts. Amen? Amen. You see, the wickedness that's happening in our world today is not evidence of no God. It's evidence of no God in many people's hearts. The fact that my children do bad things does not mean that I don't exist. But God has placed morality in the heart. Very interesting. Amen? Number five, a yearning in our hearts. You know, this is going to sound bad, but believe me, it's actually a good thing. God has actually placed in your heart, God has actually put something in your heart where you will never find fulfillment on this life without him. There is something in your life that God has placed in there, and I don't know if I can explain it all to you, but I can simply say this. You will never find satisfaction no matter how many cars you have, how many houses you have, no how much money you have in your bank account, how many women you have, how many parties you've been to, how prestigious you are. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. God has placed something in your heart that without him, you will never be completely fulfilled in this life. He's placed a yearning in your heart and mind. Amen? Listen to what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has what? He has put eternity in our hearts, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I love that, man. Blias Pascal wrote this. Read it with me. There is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every man which cannot be fulfilled by any created thing, but only by who? God, the Creator, made known through Jesus Christ. Listen to what Augustine said. He wrote, You have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they can find rest in you. You have a hunger in your heart, and you know exactly what I'm talking about today. I'll tell you what that hunger is. It's a GPS. It's God's positioning system placed inside you. 
God is calling you to himself. But if you only knew what I do, Pastor, and what my life has been like, it doesn't matter. Come as you are. Jesus will make you the way you need to be, but come as you are. Tom Brady. Is it okay if I talk about Tom Brady here in Texas? Some are like, no. <laughs> okay, I'm going to do it anyway because we have a parked car running out back so I can jump in it and leave. Tom Brady has how many Super Bowl rings? I think three of them at least. Tom Brady has good looking, very wealthy, very popular, three Super Bowl rings, interviewed on 60 Minutes. And here's what he said. People are going to think this weird, and I'm paraphrasing. You can check this out in 60 Minutes. He says, people are going to think I'm strange for saying this since I have all these things. But he says, I got to tell you right now, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. Wait a minute. Time out. You're good looking. You have lots of money. You're an incredible athlete. You got all these Super Bowl rings. The world looks at you as one of the greatest quarterbacks of all times. What do you mean there's got to be more? Well, that's just what I said. God placed in his heart a vacuum that only he can fill. And only you and I can fill as well. And he's more than willing to fill it. Amen? I love the story about an elderly couple that's driving down the road one day in their pickup truck. And she's on one side way over here by the door. And he's over here <laughs> driving. And they're driving along. And wife's sitting here and she looks over at her husband and says, Honey, whatever happened to us? He's like, what do you mean, dear? He's like, honey, remember back in the day when I was right up next to you and I was cuddling with you and all over, wrapped over each other while we were driving down the road? What's going on in our marriage? And the old man, the old man sitting there looking at her and goes, who moved? <laughs> who moved? Listen to me, this is very important. This is worth coming out today, okay? If you forget everything else I say, here it is right here. Listen to this very carefully. You are as close to God as you want to be. You can sit there and say, oh, Enoch walked with God, and Moses walked with God, and all these people walk with God. That's just in the Bible. No, you can too. You're as close as you want to be. You're only here, over here because you moved. Now it's time to move back. And God is more than willing to have a personal relationship with you and reveal himself to you. How many of you today have experienced a personal relationship with Christ? Raise your hand. Now, now I don't want people to feel bad if you're not raising your hand, so don't look around, but I just want you to keep a mental note. If you see somebody raising your hand today and you have not experienced that, I want you to find that person sometime today and ask them, how do I have that personal relationship with God? Because I'm ready to move from here over to here. Scripture. The Bible is one of the greatest evidences of God. Amen? You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? By the way, do you know that you don't have to believe in the Bible blindly? There's all kinds of evidence that we can trust the Word of God. Amen? I could do a whole sermon on this one, but I'll try to keep it simple. Archaeology continues to back the Bible. Just about the time atheists say that such and such didn't exist or so and so didn't exist, guess what? Doggone it, they dig it up. The reliability of the manuscripts, you know, we have more evidence for the Bible than the Iliad and the Odyssey, any writings by Caesar or Augustus, anything by Aristotle, anything by Plato, we have more manuscripts for the Bible. Prophetic. And we all know as Seventh-day Adventists all the prophetic proofs in the Bible that a divine hand wrote the Word of God. But I want to just tell you something else about the Bible. We're just talking about the existence of God. The Bible proves the existence of God in my mind as well. But here's something else the Bible proves. The Bible proves that God is love. Amen. Throughout the Bible, he, people and God himself testify to his great love. And on the cross, God proved it without a shadow of a doubt by sending his son Jesus to take the wrath of God in our place. Amen? Jesus absorbed the wrath so you don't have to. Jesus went to hell so you never have to. Why was that? Because God, the God who exists, he's not dead, he's alive, I believe it, and I can prove it. That God, he sent his son Jesus to die in your place. That's how valuable you are. Try unwrapping that present under your Christmas tree. And the Bible proves his love. Amen? Shows his love. Wow. Extraordinary impact it has on people's lives. I don't know if some of you have trouble with your grades. I don't know. I, I was lucky to pass high school. Even luckier to pass college. Somehow I finally wised up when I got to master's degree, but by then many people think it's too late. By then you're proven dumb. But I love this right here. You want to strengthen your intellect? 
You want to be smarter than you are right now? Scratch Minecraft. The only two of you knew about that one, but that's okay. <laughs> here it is, Steps to Christ, page 90. Look at this. Take this to the, take this to the bank. Look at this, right here. There is what? Nothing. nothing. There is nothing more calculated to strengthen the what? Yes. Intellect than the study of the scriptures. Amen? You want a higher IQ? Read the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, that's comparing scripture with scripture, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose rarely seen in these times. If we would study the Bible, three things would happen. What are they? Number one, intellect would improve. Number two, character would improve. And number three, you know, some of us are wondering around, what is God's will for my life? What's his purpose? Well, guess what? If you read the Bible, you'd figure it out. The Bible reveals our purpose. Amen? Amen. These things are all revealed in the Word of God. And number seven, the last one, is the resurrection itself. Amen? Everybody say after me, God's not dead. dead. He's alive. alive. I believe it. And I can prove it. it. Don't let anybody tell you you can't prove the existence of God. Baloney. I just did. And you can go as deep as you want in these various things we've talked about. In fact, we need to be teaching them in our Sabbath schools. We need to be preaching them from our podiums and preparing our young people for what they're going to face in secular universities. Now, I want to tell you today, I'm going to get in trouble for this. And this is not, I'm not reflecting uh, um, Harley, <laughs> his thoughts on this at all. But, but people, please listen to me. If there was ever a time to get your kids out of secular universities, it's now. Please don't misunderstand me. But pastor, didn't Daniel go to secular universities? Yes, he did, but he went there in chains. Yeah, but it's so expensive. It's not much more expensive, or sometimes it's even cheaper to go to Christian schools. But right now, folks, if there was ever a time for us to be grounded in helping our kids get grounded in the faith, it's now. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But here's the evidence for for the resurrection. They have never found his body, amen? I know some people are saying, oh, we just found his body. Well, guess what? Too late. 2,000 years, too late. The miracles that are done in the name of Jesus. I've seen people come to life through the name of Jesus. I've seen people healed from the name of Jesus. I've seen, this is even a greater miracle, I've seen people's lives changed through the power of Jesus. Tell me he doesn't exist. He's not alive. He's alive and well. He's with us here today through the person of the Holy Spirit. The martyrs. Wow. Wow. People will die for a lie. They will. Unless they know it's a lie. Amen? And a few people will die for a lie if they know it's a lie because of their pride or whatever else. But they won't die the terrible, horrible deaths the disciples died if it was a lie. Lonely by themselves when all they had to do was say, time out. (laughs) Big joke, he's really dead, I'm sorry. That's all they had to do. It used to bug me when I read about how in Fox's Book of Martyrs how the disciples perished. The terrible ways God allowed them to die, but now I understand. They laid down their lives to show us that what they were saying was doggone true. Let me show you how they died. Bartholomew was beaten with rods, crucified, and skinned alive for believing God exists, and he rose from the dead. James was beaten, stoned, and clubbed to death. Andrew was crucified. Peter was crucified upside down. John was forced to drink poison, boiled in oil, and exiled. I don't know about you, but I think I'd rather die. Thomas was impaled with spears. Oh, by the way, that's doubting Thomas. I believe some, that very, God is raising up skeptics and atheists among us. Some of them that are your own children that God is going to raise up into faith, and they're going to be great defenders of the Word of God like Thomas was. Don't stop praying for them and reaching out to them. You know, one thing about dealing with skeptics is don't get into arguments with them. As soon as you do that, you lose. You both lose. And the people that are listening will choose sides when, before they wouldn't have. Instead, let them talk. Let them share why they don't believe in God. And then you tell them the reason for the hope that you have. And invite them to receive God as their Lord and Savior. Do not get in debates with them. And when you do share with them your reason for the hope that you have, make sure you do that with your voice seasoned with salt and in love. But I will tell you right now, I've tried it so many times. You get in arguments with them and all of a sudden you're going to have two sides. They're stronger in their atheism than they ever were before because of you. Instead, let them share. Let them blow vade as long as they like on the non-existence of God. Don't hit them with, only a fool says there's no God. Don't do that. <laughs> Listen to them. And then share with them the reason from science and the Bible and your personal experience. Well, God is not dead. 
and then invite them to receive your God. So they are design, morality, fine-tuning, irreducible complexity, scripture, hunger or yearning, and finally what? The resurrection of Jesus. So what? So what if there's a God? So what? I want to tell you right now, if there's a God, then there are moral absolutes. If there's a God, there will be a great day of accountability. And I believe, and I'm suspicious, that many of these people who, are not, who claim to be atheists or skeptics are not at all. They actually believe, but those are the two things they're frightened of. Because if there is a God, then there is a law that governs his universe. And if there's a God, we all will face him on the day of judgment. You know, the Bible actually makes this very clear. Paul, uh, James, we actually learned this in Sabbath school class. Excellent Sabbath school class this morning I got to sit in. You know, James actually says that faith without works is dead. So what? This is a God. Here's why it matters. Because if you believe there's a God, then you will show it in your life as you live obediently out of love for his principles. And you will receive his son Jesus, which he lovingly gave us, that we might stand in the coming judgment. You see, believing in God is not just a mental ascent. Believing in God is, you know what? I believe and therefore I live. Jesus warned us in Luke chapter 18, verse 8. I tell you, he said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Atheism is growing unbelievably within the Seventh-day Adventist church today. It's growing all around us. People are beginning to turn away from their faith. Many of my friends in Facebook that I talk to often, they're no longer in the faith. And they've become very, very vigilant and very evangelistic about their atheism. It's called the new atheism. The old atheism, they lamented the fact there's no God. The new atheism celebrates the fact and wants everybody to believe the good news that God is dead. Jesus was right. Go figure that we would be attacked by this. If there was ever a time to shore up our faith and build up our faith, it's now. Being attacked by men like Richard Dawkins, who continually mocks those who believe in God. Bill Mayer, who does a comic routine that mocks those who believe in God. Bill Mayer, or Bill Burr, uh, Bill Burr I think it is. Bill Burr over here on the right, my right. And uh, Bill Mayer mocks the name of God. It's spreading like crazy. Pew Research Center in 2012 says this. In 2007, 83% of millennials said they never doubted the existence of God. Now in 2012, just a little bit later, five years later, now it dropped to 68% of millennials said they never doubt the existence of God. It's having an impact. The statistics that I heard on the radio the other day coming out of Dallas Theological Seminary, they said this verbatim. They said this, 70 to 90% of Christians who go to secular universities will graduate without their faith. Are Adventist schools perfect? No. But it, way better, in my opinion, ultimately. I see people looking around for an Ivy League college for their kids, thinking about how their kids can be successful in this life. You know what? I want my kids to be successful in this life. Yes, but I definitely want them in the life to come. Listen, if they deny God, they're not higher education, sir. The Bible even says this, God's foolishness is wiser than man's wisdom. You want to send them to a school where all they get is foolishness, or you want to send them where they hear from the highest God, from the Word of God, from the truth? We need to be weighing these things correctly, folks. What matters most is our children walking in the truth, the Bible says. This is important. It's critically important. You know, we prepare our kids for self-defense, physical. But do we prepare them to defend their faith if they have to go to a second university? We need to. People, we need to. We've got to prepare our young people. We've got to stop the bleeding. In our School of Evangelism Sent, which is starting next month, our first quarter we're going to be dedicating to apologetics, teaching young people how to do what we talked about today, how to defend their faith. Not only that, we're going to be teaching them how to have a personal relationship with Jesus. Amen? Because I tell you what, even if you don't have all the facts and figures about science and everything together, if you know Jesus, they can't shake you. 
Somebody once came to Billy Graham and said, Billy Graham, why don't you deny God that he even exists? Billy Graham says, I can't. And the atheist like, why not? And he said, well, because, you know, I walked with him this morning. But after saying that, I want to make sure that we're very clear that we can't just send our kids out saying, oh, I believe God is because I walked with him this morning. We also need to train them to show from science and from reason and from the Word of God that he truly is alive, not dead. We need to do this, amen? So they can also be soul winners in their secular universities or wherever they go, amen? How to build your faith. I'm going to end with this. All you need to do, if today you're sitting here going, man, I, I, I just can't, can't believe, Pastor Gary, I, I, I just can't believe. I, I have a terrible time. Here's the good news. The Bible says Jesus is the author and finisher of your faith. If you actually go to him with your doubt and skepticism, he can actually write faith into your heart. He's the author. Everybody say author. author. And the finisher. And the go to him as you are. Number one. Number two, choose godly teachers. The Bible is clear as you become like your teachers. And I don't worry about non-charismatic teachers. What I worry about is the very charismatic ones. And there are many of them. And these are the ones that if young people don't know about it, they become like their charismatic teacher. This is just the way it is. The teacher begins to be reflected in the student. The Bible even teaches this, amen? So make sure your children have godly teachers. I was a teacher at Union Springs Academy for several years, and I never once had a parent come in there to sit during my class to see if I was actually teaching them the Bible. But what's amazing is biology, parents were in there all the time. Math, parents were in there all the time. What's going on? We've got to weigh things appropriately, do we not? I'm not so concerned about the temporal. Don't misunderstand me. Biology and science and math are all important. Amen? I failed every one of them, but you know what? They're important. Amen? Amen. But at the end of the day, what's being taught in Bible class, and of course what's being taught about God in science class, and what's being taught about God in history class is important. They become like their teacher. Study the Word of God. The Bible says faith comes from hearing and hearing from the Word of God. Something supernatural happens when you read the Bible. All of a sudden, you begin to feel this new faith, this new confidence beginning to grow inside you. Amen. It comes from studying the Word. Faith comes from hearing, and hearing from what? The Word of God, Romans chapter 10. Finally, mind your media. In other words, watch what you're watching. Right now, there is an absolute strategic plan in Hollywood to undermine your faith in God. In fact, right now, Hollywood's primary thing, I believe, it's to tear down your faith in God and see God in an entirely false light. The movie Noah that teaches that the angel, evil angels were thrown out of heaven, not because they had rebelled against God and led others down a terrible, terrible path away from God. They were thrown out of heaven, according to the movie, because they came to help man. Not only is the world today attacking the existence of God, but the world today is attacking his very character. Be careful what you're watching, what you're listening to. It's designed to erode your faith. Do you know there are good programs that lift up God? Amen? Yes. This movie Unbroken that's coming out, unbelievable. There are lots of great. God still has his people. Amen? I'm not saying throw it all out. I'm saying, look, be careful what you watch because your subconscious is picking things up and one day you wake up and where'd your faith go? Well, guess what? It got robbed while you were sleeping. Oh, I love watching Bill Mayer. It's so fun to watch him. He's so funny and everybody gets in fights and blah, blah. Well, you know what? You're getting these seeds in your brain as you watch it. Build your faith up. Build your faith up. Choose media that you're going to build it up. Amen? And finally, study creation science. Amen? <laughs> study science. Don't throw science out. Science is extremely important. Amen? Hopefully I've made that really clear. It's important. By the way, Science Museum is an excellent website to go to to learn about apologetics and, and uh, learning about paleontology and other things based from the Word of God. So what do you say, people? God's not dead? He's alive? I believe it? And I can prove it. One day a man stood behind, beside a giant um, crowd of Christians and whatever else and he had all these PhDs after his name and he spent a whole hour talking about how the resurrection never happened and God is dead. And after a whole hour of listening to him, of course I would have walked out by then, but they were still there. When he was all done, he said, is there any questions? And everybody was too intimidated to speak. 
you know what? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of silent witnesses in the church. Goliath is up there mocking the God of heaven, and we're hiding behind the rocks with all of the rest of Israel. But God will raise up young men and young women like David, and old men and old women like David, amen? Amen. Who will stand up and face those giants by faith. Instead of comparing themselves to the giant, they'll compare God, the living God, to that giant, and he all of a sudden becomes grasshopper size. So anyway, the guy was talking, and everybody's all discouraged. They're all sitting there probably saying things like, uh, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. That's the biggest lie. We don't even know if Francis Assisi even said that. Preach the gospel, use words if necessary? Folks, it is necessary. How are they going to hear without the message? Yes, our life needs to show that we're committed to God. Amen? Amen. But we've got to open our mouths, otherwise they'll never hear. How will they hear without a preacher? So when he was all done, it was all quiet. Nobody said anything. And the pompous man turned around to sit back in his chair. He defeated them all. But then an old man in the back had a paper bag in his hand. He said, sir, come on back up to the podium for a minute. Always be careful when the old guys say that. Because the guy came walking back and he said, sir, I got a question for you. He had a paper bag in his hand, reached inside, pulled out an apple, <laughs> chewed it. Professor's like, okay, what's your question? Chewing on the apple. He said, hey, professor, I'm not as smart as you, but tell me, is that, this apple sweet or is it sour? And the professor said, I can't possibly know whether your apple is sweet or sour. And the man smiled and said, dropped his apple inside the bag and said, and neither have you tasted my Jesus. Neither have you tasted my Jesus. You can say all you want about God, but when you've tasted him, and you found him to be good, and you found him to be alive, there's no demon in hell that can shake you from your st- strong foundation. Thank you, Cleburne Church. God bless you. Amen.